there are so many habits that make a successful investor, right? But today, like you said, we're going to dwell on four factors that differentiates between a tycoon investor and everyone else, right? And to me, the first thing that you need to look at, and obviously I've got three adjectives that I put them together is, is your ambition, your motivation and persistence. You need to, you need to, and I put those together because they all kind of do the same thing because they're synonyms to each other. And it's finding the need and fulfilling it. So for example, for us as real estate investors, what, are, what, what is the need that we need to fulfill? And the need that we need to fulfill is shelter. That's the need. And you need to have, especially at the beginning of this year, you need to have your ambition, which is your goals that you're going to set up so that you'll be able to fulfill that need. And you need to also have that mentality that you're going to provide the best shelter among your competitors or your peers, right? And not being too excited about counting your money. You rather have to be excited about measuring your success of achievement based on a specific need that you have fulfilled. So to me, that, that's the number one thing that we need to look at. Ambition, motivation, persistence. We need that at the very beginning of any investment that we embark on. Mm. And I think, you know, one of the things that you probably take for, for granted, um, a lot of times people talk about, you know, ambition. And the thing about ambition is, you need to back it up with, you know, a track record. It's, it's, it's not enough to say that you're ambitious or you have ambitions of doing a particular thing. You almost need to go to what do I need to do on a daily basis in order for me to get, you know, just that little bit step closer uh, to doing uh, or to achieving what it is that I want to achieve. And it is one of those things that um, we sometimes take for granted. And, and, you know, I actually love that you you mentioned persistence because if, if I even reflect on my own, you know, property investment journey, you need to be quite persistent, whether it is persistent in um, the kind of knowledge that you want to learn, be persistent in when you're dealing with, for example, you know, the different financial institutions and there's a particular rate that you want, or you're negotiating a price for a property that you're viewing. Uh, you kind of need to be quite persistent sometimes with, uh, you know, different service providers. The moment you're a landlord um, and you start managing your own property, and, and I think that's one of what that's certainly a trait that you're going to need throughout your journey. So it isn't even one of those that you, you, you leave once you've acquired that first or that second property. You kind of need to be in it um, or you need that trait or that or to stick to that habit uh, for quite an extended period of time. So Echo, we, we, we have our ambition on lock. We certainly are, we, we understand that if you're going to go into the property space, Persistence is one of the things that you're going to need to, um, you know, essentially do, and you're going to need to be persistent in different ways. What would then be the second habit that peers at home need to um, be aware of and perhaps even try to slowly cultivate? Yes. So the second is having a workable and a realistic plan, right? And by realistic means that not spinning your wheels on projects that cannot produce a good profit. So spend your energy on things that's going to be equivalent to the same amount of energy that you've used. And, and that's very important. And you need to be strategic by having a written program of your activities, your objectives, and your investment criteria, such as your return on requirements, so, such as your return requirements, right? It could be the length of the investment. You need to decide upfront. Am I going to invest in this real estate business for the next five years? What is my exit strategy? And, and that's the second part. You need to always have your ex exit strategy in mind before you even step a foot to begin your journey. And once you've done that, then what the next question you're asking yourself within the same uh, workable or realistic plan is, what is the risk tolerance that I'm, I'm allowed to, to like experience or I'm, I'm going to tolerate as, a, as an investor? And that's key because you can go ahead and invest blindly thinking that, you know what, because it's cheap, I'm going to make money. 
it's not always the case. Cheap is very expensive sometimes. So you need to be able to assess your risk tolerance uh, in terms of the location, the type of property that you want to invest in. And once you have that plan written down, stick to it. Don't change that plan. Don't go sit in an auction somewhere and say, oh, because this guy is buying a property for a million, I need to now be egotistic and buy it for 1.2 million. No, your return on investment strategy says if you buy it for 1.2 million, you're going to make 10% and you want to make 15% and above. So you stick to the plan. It's, you need to be patient and you're going to get your deal. You know, I actually want to go back just slightly because I think one of the things that you've mentioned and I really love it, uh, I mean, you, you know, you know that you must have a workable and a realistic plan, which probably brings me to something that I know a lot of people at home are probably doing now. You're setting down your, you know, your annual goals for the year, perhaps your resolutions. But one of the things that we know about, um, you know, setting goals is that you must have smart goals. So it's not enough to just say, you know, I want to grow my portfolio. So you need to be uh, you know, you want to be able to say, I want to grow my portfolio by X percent, or I want to add two properties by the end of, you know, Q3, and I want to have, let's say, only spend less than a million on both those properties and have, let's say, prime uh, plus at most, let's say, 0 0.25, those kinds of things. So it's so important that you're able to also just be very direct in the kind of goals that you set for yourselves. Um, and one thing that you mentioned, though, is around the risk tolerance. Perhaps take us through how we should be thinking around um, the amount of risk. I mean, I think you and I both know that depending on the kind of property that you'd go for, how big the deal is, it gets riskier and riskier. Oftentimes when, um, you know, you know Oftentimes when you're doing, for example, commercial deals or slightly bigger ones, banks will want you to put down some of your own money. So you aren't just raising, you know, capital from the bank, but perhaps you're even going to other investors. And some of those investors could easily be friends and family. So it's very easy for, you know, a, a property deal to be relatively risky um, because not everybody goes the conventional route of getting 100% bond finance. So what, how should we be looking at um, risk when it comes to property and perhaps even when you can see that the numbers don't quite make sense what should be the thinking process to just help us through that okay so of course the first thing you need to look at when you're talking about the risk tolerance is cash is king so your cash flow must make sense and to me i always say that i'm very conservative i'm a i'm an i'm an aggressive investor but very conservative when it comes to cash flow so, and COVID has proven it. That's whether the strategy that we were using was good or bad. COVID just proved it. It's a, 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 and you need to make sure that whatever that you're doing, again, like we go back to my 80-20 principle, right? Where I say, whatever that you're doing, the, the, it doesn't matter how much the property is, you, you need to look at only getting 80% of that deal from your side, because no matter how bad the market is going to be, you are already have an 80% buffer. But I normally don't use the 80%, I do 60%. And that's how conservative I am with my cash flow. I'm very aggressive in terms of the project that I take on. But 60%. And why do you do that? Because you're saying that no matter how bad the situation is, you're going to be able to collect 60% of your rental income because this is the environment we're living in now. And if you collect 60% of the rental income, it should be able to at least satisfy your, your necessity needs in terms of your budget. So paying your bills, paying school fees, petrol money, pocket money, those things should sit within your 60%. And that's what we do with Big Grand at Property Asker Code, the student that we teach. That is the mentality that we burden, right? In terms of your return on investment, I normally say I don't do a deal that's going to give me less than 15% return on investment. The reason is, if you go through historical interest rate in South Africa, the worst we've been in was around 26%. And that was, I think, in 1996 or 1997. I'm not sure on the date, but we can go back. So, so we've been there. We've been to 26% interest rate before in this country. So if you take historical data and you break it down, and that's why I always say, 
investment must be art and science. It must not just be, oh, my gut feeling. Gut feeling doesn't pay bills. The, the meds pay bills. And you need to understand that. So, so once you've achieved that, and to me, from what, where we're sitting, we know that at 15%, we'll be able to break even, no matter how bad the market goes. If we hit 26%, as proven historically, we'll still be able to wash our faces. And that is, that is the strategy you need to have. And that's why I'm saying that you need to have, you define that risk tolerance and you stick to it. You don't move, you stay with it like a glue. And that's how it's supposed to be done. Mm. I'm in conversation with Echo Quagra, who's a part of B Grand Holdings, and we're looking at the habits uh, that every property investor should adopt in 2021. I certainly want to hear from you at home. Uh, if you were, or certainly if you've been watching the podcast uh, over the past couple of months last year, you know, what are some of the, the key things that you've picked up as, you know, for you needing to cultivate uh, and certainly practice regularly as you, you walk your property journey, especially if you are a property investor. And I also want to hear from you what your property goals for the year are. I think the great thing that we heard, especially in the tail end of last year, was all the great uh, property milestones a lot of you at home were able to reach. Um, I remember one viewer on YouTube also showing that they were able to buy, I think it was five properties at 100% LTV, and they really enjoyed watching the podcast and learning so much. So do let us know what those property goals are for 2021, and we'll make sure that at the end of the year, we see if you're able to tick them off. I am seeing your comments and uh, here on just on the screen, it's slightly smaller than my end. I must actually ask them uh, to send it to my phone. Send me my slides are one of the top 10 gang members saying, Kumala, I love what you are talking about today. Uh, hashtag plan. I love that, Sam. We always need to plan. I think one of the things that last year showed us is that, um, especially in the property space, a lot of people were not ready for the, the knock that the property sector took on. And then there were just so many various opportunities. And if anything, the opportunities are only able to be taken by people who were, for the most part, ready for them. I mean, I've seen, for example, um, that a lot of properties, or there's been a number of properties that went on auction that ended up selling for slightly less than what um, they were. So opportunities like that certainly do come up. Uh, we are seeing a lot of owners also selling some of their properties, whether it is to offload the stock or to open up a bit of room uh, in their own you know, cash flow. There are various reasons why a seller would sell. Perhaps they're also eyeing a bigger property uh, that will make better sense for their property strategy uh, for the new year. So one of the ways that you're able to take advantage of so many of these deals, of course, is if you've planned uh, effectively. So we send, I certainly want to hear from you at home. What are some of your property goals? Do share them down here below uh, with us across, of course, our social media platforms. You can reach me on my own social media platform on at Zamantunga underscore K. Now, Echo, I think one of the things that you, you know, touch on that's so important um, is that you, we need to be able to run our numbers and do it really well. And I think we'll definitely be uh, looking at the numbers game in other episodes as well, because it is one of those big pressure points. Uh, because as you're saying, property isn't just about, oh, I own 10 units or X number of units, but it, it really is about the rands and cents and whether they're stacking up. And sometimes, unfortunately, a deal just doesn't stack up. You know, you may like the property, it might be in a good area, but when you start running your numbers, it just doesn't give you the kind of yield that you're looking for. Um, a bit of a cheeky question for you, especially right now. I mean, we're seeing a lot of uh, stock on the market uh, almost throughout the regions. And some people perhaps might want to buy because they now qualify or think, look, let me just add on um, this particular property. Even if the numbers don't stack up now, maybe they'll stack up um, in the coming months. Because one of the things that we've also seen, of course, is that rental prices are slowly going down um, and a lot of landlords are having to adjust their rental prices because of the market that we're finding ourselves in. How should viewers at home be thinking through buying an asset that looks, you know, we'll say it, re it looks relatively good pre-COVID numbers, 
uh, and the kind of uh, rental it was able to attract at that point. And let's assume that the expenses were also not that high, but now because of the effects of COVID and rental, perhaps not just staying where it is, but having to just go down slightly. Should you bite the bullet and buy that uh, property and perhaps in the next coming months, you'll be able to recover? Or should you rather say, look, it's not stacking up right now, therefore just don't buy it? How should we be thinking about it? Okay, so I'll answer this question in two folds. And the first thing is history is always the basic point of any business strategy. COVID has now been part of us and it's a history now. Like we're still in the current processes, but I'll call it history because yesterday is history, today is current. Now COVID is telling you that people are adjusting their prices, right? We as Big Brand, we've also adjusted our prices and we're still breeding fine because we were conservative in our approach. So anybody that's going to buy a property for investment now, my advice is approach that investment from a thinking place and not a hard place. A hard place is it looks good. It was in a clean area. People, you know, it used to give 10,000 rand and now it's giving 5,000 rand. It's fine, buy it and make sure that as an investor, your first principle is who is going to pay for me. And if that person is going to pay and you're going to put more than what you need in that deal, walk away from that deal. That is my advice. Walk away from that deal. Make sure you're not putting a cent of your money in that deal. Then go three, four blocks away on the same street and you'll find your baby. That's my advice. Don't buy purely because you admire the property. Buy purely because it is going to make you money. At the end of the day, that's part of the reasons why you invest in. You want to make money. Above all, you want to provide what you, uh, you want to provide services, a better services, one of the exceptional services in the street. That's what you want to provide. But that services is backed by the money that people pay you. And one of the successes that we've had during COVID is because of the way we treat our clients, which is our tenants. Majority of our tenants have not moved out. Majority of our tenants have paid. Where the tenants were bad or were not even making money or they've lost their job, they came to the office and handed over the keys. Majority of our tenants handed over the keys. And when you provide good services and not being familiar with your clients, but being friendly, and that's something that I've learned in the past week, being friendly with your clients, you will be able to kind of weather the storm that's coming. But the bottom line is, it's a numbers game. That's the game of property. Mm -mm -mm. We are taking your questions and comments at home. I want to hear from you. What are some of your, uh, your property goals and ambitions for this year? Uh, we love hearing that, especially because at the end of the year, we'll get to uh, look at whether we're able to take them off. I'll try to see if we can do it quarterly, because I think one of the great things is you actually want to do a quarterly check-in with yourself. I usually have a annual strat plan. My birthday is in January. It was my birthday last week, Monday. And usually around my birthday, I have, you know, a strat plan and almost look at not just the year that's coming ahead, but almost look at, you know, a five-year period. What are some of the things that I want to take off and want to have achieved? And do regular check-ins with myself, you know, whether it is quarterly check-ins to see how far I am with some of my goals, monthly check-ins, and sometimes even weekly, because I think there are certain goals that you need to monitor uh, on a weekly basis, because you want to almost break it down bit by bit. And I, we are taking your questions and comments. I see one of the top 10 gang members is uh, saying we need to invest more in property, but this pandemic is slowing us down. Hopefully things will get back uh, to normal soon. I don't see them going back to normal. I think we're going to have to uh, realize that we have a completely different normal that's coming our way and we need to fundamentally adapt to, to that new normal, uh, whichever that new normal is going to be. Uh, Semi continues to say, my plan is to add one more property, but I need to see how the year goes uh, when the Department of Health introduces the vaccine. Uh, we've also got a comment um, here from Kay Fortune 
uh, who says, I want to sell and to purchase elsewhere and then invest and rent for a year. Then I want to clear my debt and apply for a bond and cash out uh, part of my investment to buy a home. Will it work? Uh, that guarantee, what guarantees do I have? So there's certainly a lot that Kay wants to do, Echo. I think before you even look at will that strategy works, because on the one hand, you want to pay off debt. On the other hand, you want to go into property. One of the things I certainly want to hear from you, um, Echo, is how should people who already, who currently have debt, uh, and let's assume it's not a car, let's think uh, maybe they are cell phone contracts, maybe store accounts, uh, credit card debt. How should they be looking at prioritizing, you know, servicing the debt first? Um, and let's assume here they are paying their debts on time. So it's not a matter of, uh, you know, they are missing their debt repayment. They're paying their debt on time. What should they be strategizing first in terms of prioritizing uh, getting that property? I mean, I, I, I'll i share my own view with about this particular one because I've been on that boat. Uh, but Eko, how should we be looking at the different ways of either managing debt uh, juxtaposed with buying a, a property? Okay, so I think it's very, very good question, Zama. And um, the way you manage debt is basically you look at the chunk of it because you've got different types of debt, right? For, for starters, when I look at my debt, I normally always want to pay the one with the highest interest rate first. That's what I do. Because if I can kill that one, then our, my affordability will be higher. So that's, that's where I look at. That's how I normally start. So once you've figured out, or, you, or someone will say, I have a friend who normally says, okay, I don't go with the, with the highest interest rates one, but I go with the, with the one that takes majority of my income. So he sit down and says, if I want to buy a property for a million and I need 10,000 rand a month, that's extra uh, free cash flow on my balance sheet, or sorry, on my income statement, then what do I do? So he looks into all the debts that he has, that obligations that he has and says, okay, this is, I'm paying 5,000 on this. So if I can reduce this 5,000 to say a thousand rand, then I've got excess cash because he's done, he's done his cash flow analysis and he knows if that money is out, irrespective of whatever the interest rate might be to him, he's saying, I'm paying 2,000, even if it's a 25% interest rate and I'm paying 10,000, this is a 10% interest rate. But if I pay this 10,000 off my books, it will enable me to get access to a million rand. That's how he looks at it. Mine is completely different. I look at the interest rate approach and both method makes sense. So I would say people based on your, on, again, your risk tolerance and based on your own lifestyle, personal lifestyle, you can adapt any of these two strategies and they both work very fine. Yeah. Uh, and I think, I mean, I was saying earlier that I certainly have my own take with this one. I, I love the approach that um, Echo has, has highlighted. Um, one of the things though that I will emphasize is do speak to a financial advisor because you want to do your needs analysis. You want to do your balance sheet. You want to do the different um, way, like almost iterations of the direction that you can take. Um, and I think you want to make sure that at the end of the day, you are eliminating the debt that you want to eliminate uh, so that you're not obviously spending all that money on interest rates servicing um, what a lot of people would term bad debt. So I think, hey, one of the things definitely do reach out to um, you know, a financial advisor to get your insight from them. Um, last question from viewers at home. Uh, this one is coming from Subamu. Uh, Marcus, who says, is it wise to buy a flat to rent out while I live at home? I love this one because I think it's, a, it's an easy one. Echo? Yes, it's, it's, it's smart and wise to buy a flat, rent it out whilst you live at home. The important thing is somebody's paying the bond. That is the key. Because when you live at home, your expenses is kind of minimized, right? You've got a brother, you've got a sister, you contribute as opposed to being the sole contributor of whatever that you do in life. So, so I will always advise if you've got somewhere to stay for free or you've got somewhere to stay and pay less, then why not stay at home, buy that property, rent it out. The important thing is you're doing something about your life and you're investing. 
and you're generating cash flow. I want to echo that one because I think one of the things that you underestimate, especially once you've bought, I mean, you, you, we, we talk about the running costs of owning a property and we tend to underestimate it. I think as homeowners, you usually just think of your bond payment, uh, but if you're going to be living in a sectional title community, you're obviously also going to have your levies, you're going to have your rates and taxes. Uh, sometimes you must do maintenance for your place. If your geezer bursts, you must pay for the insurance, um, in, you know, for the access for the insurance. So there are all these costs that you typically wouldn't have when you live at home. Uh, I always say to people, if you can afford to live at home, and I don't mean financially afford to, I mean, if home is conveniently close to work, um, if you've got a healthy home environment where you're still able to live with, whether it's your parents or your siblings, and it doesn't uh, you know, negatively affect your mental health, stay for as long as you possibly can. I think if anything in South Africa, we are slightly different to some of our, you know, peers abroad. When I speak to a lot of my friends uh, who live in big cities like your London, many of them stay with their parents well into their 30s. And these are professionals. And it's because of the high cost of uh, renting, but also the high cost of buying. So it's become this norm, especially right now, for them to live with their parents uh, well into their mid-30s because it's just so expensive. So if you're able to stay at home, don't, don't, don't be pressured to leave your home. I think you're still able to buy while living at home and actually save up quite a bit. Echo, before I let you go, any final tips for viewers at home, especially as we, you know, get ready for uh, 2021, get ready for setting some of our 2021 goals uh, and really looking at what we want to achieve for 2021 as far as our property uh, portfolios are concerned. Yes, so uh, my, my advice is when you're setting your goals, and I think we've spoken a whole lot about goal setting. Your goal setting has a formula, which I learned about five years ago. So the formula is you need to have a verb you need plus the noun, plus the outcome, plus the due date, right? So for example, if you're, if, for example, Echo, my goal for my property investment is that I need to increase my rental portfolio by 20% by the end of 26 June, 2021 and 26 June is because it's my birthday. So like similar to you, Zama, that is how I set up my goals. So mine ends in the mid year. So it's always overlapping. So that is, that is the kind of thing. And one of the things that people need to do is they need to stay organized. They need to stay educated and alert. By that, it means you need to read, you need to listen, you need to avoid unproductive stuff. You need to go into things that's going to enhance your personal development and your financial career, as opposed to things that are going to actually depict them. So those are the things that we need to look at. And don't forget, we need to exercise regularly. We need to meditate regularly. As the saying goes, a healthy mind breeds a healthy body and vice versa. So those are the things that I will leave with people. Yeah. It's very crucial that we put everything together. But above all, goal setting is not something that you're going to hang in your wardrobe for a decoration. You need to put in the effort. And like you said, Zama, one thing I liked about what you said is you break it down. And something similar to what I do, I break it down. It's, it's a yearly goal, becomes a monthly goal, it becomes a weekly goal, and it becomes a daily goal. And not too many goals, Zama. It shouldn't be too many goals. One, two goals. The aim at this year, like one of your listeners at the questions that they ask, I need to buy two properties. It's as easy as that. Somebody might think, no, two properties is too small, but that's if it's achieved, you've moved forward in life. So not too many goals, one simple goal and get it done and get it done right and get out.